Um, okay, let me start. So uh, today uh, we will continue our uh, discussion uh, in inverse design on inverse design in photonics. Uh, and in particular, we'll talk about uh, the technique that allow us to incorporate uh, basic feature constraints. So uh, as a brief uh, review uh, from what we talked about last time, uh, last time we gave a, a simple demo of using inverse design to make a lens. And so uh, here in this design, what we do is we have a source, have a focusing region, and we try to design the uh, uh, a dielectric region in between uh, so that the wave generated by the source will get focused uh, in the uh, uh, intended focusing region. And uh, the design uh, was achieved by simply adjusting the uh, value of the permittivity uh, inside the design region. Uh, you can see that it actually works very well with a few iterations. It actually produced the right uh, focusing behavior. Uh, but in uh, reality, uh, there is, uh, in fact, a lot you need more that you need to do in order to produce a design that satisfies a fabrication constraint. And that is uh, what we will be talking about today. So, uh, well, what kind of fabrication constraint do you usually encounter? Uh, for example, uh, in silicon photonics, and here's an example of one of those silicon photonic devices with a uh, silicon ring coupled to a waveguide. Uh, these are typically produced uh, by uh, etching uh, a thin film of silicon. So uh, the result is that the structure then would only include uh, silicon regions and air regions. So for each of the region, therefore, there are actually only two possible permittivity, the permittivity of the silicon and the permittivity of air. And uh, if you want to produce a structure that you can fabricate, then you would need to take that into account. And so that has to be taken into account uh, in the optimization algorithm. Uh, there are many other fabrication constraints that one can think of. For example, if you do this with a lithography, the minimum feature size that you can produce uh, is usually constrained uh, depending on your fabrication technique. And so uh, that again need to be taken into account. So uh, in general, uh, when you uh, need to actually construct a photonic device, uh, the uh, design process need to be able to incorporate uh, all these considerations uh, in order to produce a actually a usable device. So uh, we will illustrate uh, how we incorporate some of the constraints that I talked about just now uh, with this uh, example of a mole converter. So uh, in this mode converter, the device consists of a, a input uh, waveguide and an output waveguide. In this case, both uh, are multimoded. And so the intent of the design uh, is to take uh, the one of the eigen mode of the input waveguide and then try to convert that uh, with as high an efficiency as possible uh, to an output mode uh, in the output waveguide. So uh, you achieve this conversion by putting in a design region in between and try to put in the right structure to enable uh, this kind of uh, conversion. So uh, now uh, if you do that with a silicon photonic thing, then usually the structure consists of a thin silicon film uh, sitting on top of a silicon dioxide and then you etch the design region. So therefore the design region would just consist of silicon and air. And in this case, the objective function is the uh, overlap, uh, the overlap integral uh, between the actual output of the waveguide and the desired uh, model shape. Now uh, you can uh, do it directly uh, by adjusting the permittivity inside the desired region uh, directly with the adjunct variable method that we talk about, uh, where we compute the gradient uh, of a cost function to uh, these permittivity. And you can produce a design that works. So here's an example. So you can see uh, on the image here that you have a fundamental mode here in the input waveguide. And after passing through the design region, you produce the uh, first uh, excited mode or first high order mode. Uh, so the fundamental mode is even, the uh, higher order mode is odd. So you can see that it actually works quite well. Uh, but if you look at the structure that you produce out of this kind of design, uh, 
then you see that it has a, a continuous uh, variation uh, from the low end of the permittivity assumed to be air to the high end of the permittivity uh, assumed to be uh, silicon. And uh, uh, this is not uh, binarized uh, in the sense that uh, it doesn't contain only two permittivity value, but in general, it contain uh, a continuum of permittivity value. So uh, to produce a, a fabricable device uh, using standard technique, ideally, you would like a structure that only have two permittivity value, and moreover, has large enough feature size so you can nano fabricate. So um, in order to incorporate uh, these kind of fabrication constraint, and in fact, uh, the general idea to incorporate these kind of fabrication constraint is that you do not directly optimize the permittivity. Instead, first of all, you imagine a function that go from parameters, a parameter space, through a function to generate this permittivity. Now, the reason you do so is because then this function can be designed so that it incorporate the kind of constraint that you care about. And in our case, for example, binarization, having only two permittivities or having feature size constraint. Let me start with the uh, binarization. So uh, now, in this kind of, uh, in choosing this kind of function, uh, it is important that this function, that you go from the parameter space to the permittivity space is smooth and differentiable. The reason for this is that we ultimately would like to be able to optimize this device and we're gonna optimize this device by gradient. In the uh, last example, I've shown you how you can efficiently compute the gradient of a objective function J with respect to permittivity values at each of these pixels. Now, if you have a smooth and differentiable permittization, then you can further backpropagate that gradient to become the gradient of the cost function with respect to these parameters. So therefore, once you have the gradient with respect to the parameters, you can then use this to adjust the structure in the parameter space. And because of the choice of the function, this will always produce a function that satisfy your uh, fabrication constraint. And in the meantime, you can apply your uh, gradient uh, algorithm, gradient-based optimization algorithm to optimize the structure within the constraint of the fabrication. So uh, let's start with binarization. So the idea of a binarization is that you imagine a primitive parameter value that goes through a, a hyper hyperbolic tangent function and convert that into a value uh, that is permittivity between the uh, between the low end and the high end of the permittivity function. And uh, this is how the function shape look like. And it has a, a parameter beta here. When the beta is small, you have a very smooth function and the beta is large. You gradually turn this into a more stacked looking function. And uh, the, the point here is to choose a beta value so that the pixel permittivity is largely at these two ends, and that help you to produce a binarized structure. And so uh, in the uh, optimization then, uh, we would just optimize the parameter P as we talked about, but eventually it's gonna produce a binarized structure. So uh, here are some of the uh, optimization results. Uh, as I said, in this case, we optimize those parameters and we change the beta value. So when the beta value is small, uh, you produce a, a structure with a, a continuous variation of a, a permittivity. But if you increase the beta value, for example, to about 10, uh, in this case, here is the uh, permittivity distribution. And you can see that now you produce a, a binarized structure. So all these three structures that I show here uh, all works 
uh, to, as you can see, they convert the fundamental mode to the higher order mode. Uh, but uh, when you choose a large beta value, you can produce a binary structure. So that's a nice first step. But if you look at the structure that you produce in here, uh, you can see that it is binarized, uh, but it, the permittivity varies uh, very rapidly, uh, pixel by pixel. And so if you need to fabricate one of these structures, uh, it's difficult because the feature sizes uh, will be very small. So uh, you will also need to uh, incorporate uh, the feature size constraint. So uh, the idea here is to make the mapping uh, from the permittivity, from, excuse me, the parameter to the permittivity uh, slightly more complicated. So now you imagine a two-step process. Again, you have this uh, parameter space where the parameter can vary pixel by pixel. But uh, before you pass through this uh, tangent hyperbolic tangent function, the first thing you do is you convolve it with a kernel so that you can smooth the value of the parameter in real space a little bit. Then you pass through this hyperbolic tangent function. Now, as you do that, then you have the control of the range of the kernel by a radius of capital R, and the larger R smooths the parameter space further to produce larger feature size. So in doing so, you have a control beta that controls how binarized the structure is going to be, and you have a parameter R that controls how uh, control something that's related to feature sizes. And moreover, these functions are chosen so that the map from the parameter space to the permittivity space are smooth so that you can do differentiation all the way to generate gradient to the parameters. And so here are some of the uh, optimization results. Uh, 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 so if you choose this uh, uh, r equal to zero, which means that you don't smooth, that's what we've seen, you produce a uh, near binary structure, but it's have very, very small feature size. Now uh, you can increase R, and now you can see that you again produce a structure, but now it has much larger feature size, and the feature sizes uh, further increases as you uh, increase the R value. In this particular case, you all three uh, choices of R uh, produce structures that essentially works. Uh, however, uh, with the choice of a large R value, you can produce a structure that has much larger features. So uh, I show you here example of a, a two-dimensional uh, simulation optimization. Uh, you can do that on 3D as well. So that's exactly the structure that I talked about uh, with a silicon film uh, sitting on the, uh, uh, on the silicon dioxide substrate. And uh, uh, here is a top view of the structure. And you can see that with the uh, our technique and uh, with the parameter that controls the uh, convolution radius and also with a uh, hyperbolic tangent function of a large beta value, if we use that, and you run 50 iterations optimization, you produce a structure that work uh, very well. But also, if you look at the structure, uh, it's uh, it, uh, very much well binarized and also have very large features. So um, with this, now let me uh, summarize here. Uh, as you can see, uh, an important idea to incorporate uh, fabrication constraint is to uh, imagine a parameter space and map that parameter space into permittivity distribution. In doing so, then you can envision the function that does the mapping from the parameter space to the permittivity space, and you can control this function to uh, incorporate the kind of constraint that you care about. And this, uh, there is, uh, of course, a lot of degree of freedom and also a lot of thinking that can go into choosing the right kind of mapping from the parameter space to your permittivity or your structure uh, in order to incorporate the right kind of constraint that you'll be thinking about. And uh, some of these considerations we'll discuss in more details uh, in future lectures. And uh, But I will stop here and thank you for your attention.